Well, hi everyone, it's Rusty again, and today I thought it'd be nice to take a break from all the great advice that I've been given on this channel, and let's look at the dark side of hiking advice. Those, those ideas that just caused me to, to shake my head. So let's look at some of the worst hiking advice I've ever heard. So the suggestions that I'm about to go over here in this presentation um, were gathered from some of my friends. And when these friends, uh, you'll see them here in Nacho, Stumbledor, Weather Shack, and Yogi, all people that I've hiked in for, at one time or another, um, they're not advocating these. These are things that they have actually heard other hikers say or tell them or advise them. So um, between the five of us, so I include myself in this, these are some of the worst ideas that we've heard out on the trail. So first let's start with the ones that I call water ugly. Uh, ugly advice having to do with water. First one, uh, the most common one I hear is just don't bother treating water. You can tell by looking at the source whether it's good or not. And this is not true. You cannot tell by looking at the water or seeing it coming out of a, a spring, you know, where it's coming out. Um, you just can't tell. I mean, there, there are s springs that do get tested, uh, usually when it's uh, in a town, a hill town somewhere, and they have to close down, uh, you know, forbid people from taking water from it because uh, there's too high of E. coli or chlorophyll, or whatever the things are in it. It's just like, no, you can't tell by looking at it. Um, I've seen, you know, 50.1% of the streams probably are perfectly safe, but you just don't know which ones there are. I mean, in Russian roulette, there's five empty chambers and one full one, but that doesn't mean it's a good idea to, to play Russian roulette. So don't play Russian roulette with the water. Another one, now this is uh, bad because it's given as a catch-all, as an across-the-board recommendation, and that is don't bother with electrolytes. Yeah, I can see some circumstances or, or people who are in a certain hiking condition maybe don't need to be drinking electrolytes all day. But uh, for the average beginner, weekender, section hiker, uh, somebody hiking in particularly uh, humid circumstances or particularly hot like the Grand Canyon, uh, you really do need the electrolytes, uh, whether it's Propel or Gatorade or, or you know one of the fancier types, drippy drops or whatever the hell they're called. Um, just drink as much electrolytes as uh, seems reasonable to you, but, but don't go without them. Another suggestion, now I'd never heard this before, I actually heard this from Nacho. Uh, somebody suggested that to him that you just don't bother carrying water. Just camel up at the sources and then hike to the next one. And I agree with the camel up part. Yeah, when you come to a source, especially if water is rare, yeah, go ahead, camel up, drink some electrolytes like I already suggested. And, and uh, load up your water so you can get to the next source. But depending on getting to the next source without water in between, in between is, is pretty ridiculous. For one thing, what happens if you get to the next source and it's dry? Or what happens if the next known source isn't for another 10 or 15 miles? Um, you don't want to be going 10 or 15 miles just based on something you drink at one water source and then a hike for uh, 15 miles, which is gonna be a, you know probably six hours at least, and for me, seven, seven and a half hours. Uh, for an average uh, hiker or a beginner hiker, that might be eight or nine hours. You just can't do it, it's just, it's just absurd. Um, just walk through the streams with your boots on. And, and when this was offered, I actually heard this from some hikers. Uh, they weren't talking about little two or three inch streams where, yeah, it's not gonna go over the top of your boots. They were talking about things that you might have to afford. They were just crashing through them. And I think they were showing off. I think they were actually idiots. You know, seriously, um, keeping your feet dry uh, is, is important to the health of your feet. And just going through streams in your boots is, is beyond stupid and into idiotic. This next one, I give the 
shaking my damn head or face palm emoticon on here. And that is keep a pee bottle in your sleeping bag. Now I object to both sides. I mean, keeping a pee bottle, seriously, are you really that lazy that you're not gonna get out of your sleeping bag and out of your tent at night if you have to uh, relieve yourself? I mean, the, the, before you go to bed, figure out where you're gonna go. You know, find a bush somewhere. I mean, you're out in the woods to make sure you're not taking a leak on somebody else's campsite, but you know, plan it ahead of time and be ready to go. Uh, keeping a pee bottle to me is just a ridiculous idea. There's just too many opportunities for mishap. Now, keeping your sleeping bag, I don't recall the reason why the person said, I think it was so that you'd always know where to find it. Well, you know, the second worst thing that can happen to your sleeping bag is for it to get wet, especially if it's a down sleeping bag. The worst thing that can happen is that it get wet with urine. I mean, this is a a real facepalm moment for me when I heard this advice. I mean, I I guess I understand the guy was saying, you know, keep a bee bottle, especially if it's really cold out. But to me, that's just absurd. It's not worth it. The chance of mishap is too high. Keeping it in your sleeping bag, that goes beyond. I'm at a loss for words, as you can tell on that one. I mean, you know, if the cover comes off, if the bottle breaks, I don't even want to think about it. So let's go on to what I'll call equipment ugly suggestions. First is don't bother with trucking poles. Now I think this is a bad advice because when it's offered as a universal advice, it's just, you know, it doesn't work universally. Yeah, there are some people who can hike without them, though I've seen a lot of people without them who really, you could tell, could have benefited from them. There are situations where you may have to stow them. Uh, if you're doing particularly steep climbs, you might be better off using your hands and and you know and and feet rather than trying to deal with uh, trekking poles. They do become a uh, you know they're no longer an asset. They become you know a problem if it's particularly steep. But stow them before you go down that steep thing. But as a general rule, trekking poles are a real good idea. Now this next one is. Uh, from some somebody else obviously because of somebody who did have trekking poles and they suggested that we um, cut the straps off your poles to save weight um, this is another nonsense weight saving idea i have a trekking pole right here just want to show you the strap actually serves a purpose um, the strap makes it much easier to hold on to you don't have to grip it so hard uh, you walk 15, 20 miles gripping a, a pole without a strap to help you and uh, I say walk a mile that way and you'll understand the value of the straps. Um, the, you know, this whole idea of eliminating everything will just like, just go out and hike without a pack if, if you're going to go to such absurd lengths and just hope you can get the you know get done with your hike before you starve to death or, or die of thirst so no don't cut the straps off your poles to save weight but believe it or not that's not the face palm icon on this page and that comes now don't bother with a headlamp use your cell phone instead now yeah most of us do have cell phones that have a uh, flashlight built into them and that's actually fine if you're inside your tent or in a shelter or in your hammock and trying to find something, you probably could use that. But your headlamp is actually a piece of safety equipment. If you find yourself stuck in a place where camping, say, not allowed or you just can't find a good spot because it's just not appropriate terrain for it or uh, appropriate uh, you know, undergrowth for it, and you have to hike a little after dark, you cannot do that holding your... Uh, your your phone out as a flashlight while you're trying to hike. You're just like, you, you know, humans only have two hands and you need the two of them for your, your tracking poles, which you should have. And holding that out as a flashlight is just a, it's, it's a non-starter. This was pr the stupidest idea that I personally came across when it came to uh, camping. Your headlamp is a piece of safety equipment. It's light enough. Um, Believe it or not, the, the little, I guess most of them have AAA batteries. Um, 
they can last for quite a while. So unless you're on an extended, extended trip where you won't have a, a chance to replace them, yeah, you may have to bring an extra set of batteries, but they're small enough and light enough. So that's the, the stupidest idea of the equipment ugly suggestions. Um, drill holes in your toothbrush handle to save weight. I don't really want to comment on, on that, that, uh, you know, in all seriousness, if you're trying to save weight, weigh all your equipment, come up with a list, do it in Excel, and order the stuff in, in order of, of weight. And you've got to look at the heaviest stuff to, to save weight from. Uh, drilling holes in a toothbrush handle, again, is, is just showing off, I think. Um, don't bring a trowel. Well, this is, it depends on the circumstance. In a lot of the Appalachian Trail, there are plenty of privies and, uh, you know, you don't really need necessarily a trowel. But if you're going to be stealth camping, or if you like to stealth camp and that's what you're going to be doing, you really should bring a trowel with you. Um, I brought one with me on my last uh, hike. Yeah, I only used it twice, but it was light enough and it was cheap enough. It wasn't a very expensive piece of equipment. It was like, a, you know, I got it at a dollar store or something. And uh, I was, you know, I, I did use it. There are parts of Tennessee that I was about to get into where I probably would have had to use it for uh, extended periods. Some people say you can dig the hole with your trekking pole. As long as you haven't listened to the advice that says don't bring trekking poles. And uh, that's not really effective for, you know, a true cat hole. I mean, let's, let's be responsible. Let's really dig the six to eight inches. Just bring the trowel with you. Um, a lot of uh, hikers' uh, YouTube videos um, where they had originally said uh, it's not needed, they've even changed their uh, their position on that and said, yeah, you really should bring a, a lightweight trowel with you at the least. Um, the other bad advice is, you know, don't bother with a tent or a hammock, just depend on the shelters. Um, there are some stretches where there are no shelters. Uh, you may be locked out of a shelter just because they're full. Um, I personally try to avoid using shelters on my most recent trip, which was 17 days. I did take shelters two days. Once was with one other person, once I was alone. Well, I say I was alone, but I shared it with a mouse, and then I start thinking about haunted virus and all that sort of stuff. Um, there was really no reason for me not to have set up my tent. There was some good tenting locations at uh, both those uh, shelters. Uh, one case, I was just pretty tired. And uh, the other case, I just said, well, I was the only person there. I'll take it. But I'm probably going to do that less and less. Um, even in the Smokies where the rule, the general rule is you should, you must take the shelter um, if there's space available and only use your tent if there's no space in the shelter. Uh, during the era of COVID, they have actually relaxed that and you can use the uh, your tent. But depending on being able to go into a tent or sleeping under the stars, um, not a good idea. Uh, you can get caught in rain and have no nothing available to you. Uh, you may be caught between shelters. Just, just bring your tent or your hammock if that's your preference. So knowledge ugly. In other words, ugly advice having to do with, you know, your knowledge of your trip. Don't bother with maps or a trail app. Well, okay, back in the 60s, all we had was a AAA road map with a dotted line. That was the trail. But just because that's what we were forced to go with back then doesn't mean that it's a good idea now. Having the best information you can. I mean, you know, a lot of people say, well, I don't want to give up the thrill of, uh, of uh, discovery while I'm out there. You know, I, I don't want to know what's coming next. I want to discover it. Well, you know, you look at a shelter on a on a map or in your gut hook or far out application, it's still a process of discovery because you get to the show, you don't know what it looks like. I mean, unless you've looked at pictures of it ahead of time. Um, but there's still, believe me, it doesn't take away any of the thrill of discovery and it sure makes your, uh, your, your, your peace of mind um, a lot better knowing that, hey, I can go to a a uh, shelter, or there's a good stealth site coming up, or there's a shelter with a bear box, or, or whatever it is, and especially when it comes to water sources. Now, 
Not everything that's marked on these maps or marked in the app as a water source is necessarily available to you. It may dry up depending on the time of year that you are there, but you're more likely to be able to find a water source. I've seen water sources marked that aren't there. I've never seen um, often, I haven't seen it often, a water source that wasn't marked. So your best chance is to use these apps, use Far Out, use a map if it's up to date, to make sure you know what you're getting into. Another suggestion that we heard was, don't worry about the weather, just take it as it comes. Well, you know, you may not have noticed, but in the past few years, weather really has been changing in the, in the world. Uh, there are a lot more uh, hot days, a lot more rain. I did find an app uh, when I had 4G, it was a website, but when I had 4G a service, I could actually tell uh, the real short-term estimates of when rain was going to let up was a very valuable thing for me to know. Um, knowing when thunderstorms are coming, that's especially important in when they're going to be coming through. Uh, the, the, these weather apps are, are, are actually pretty good when it comes to the short, short-term stuff because it's kind of like all of the, you know, the, the chaos and everything has, is kind of, you know, narrowed down in the variation of what's going to happen the closer you get to the time of now you know the better the the estimates are and i found them to be very valuable when i hiked for like 30 miles in the rain it was really good to know that hey i can stop at this shelter i can sit it out for 45 minutes and the rain's going to be gone a lot safer so worry about the weather and take advantage of of whatever knowledge you can get especially thunderstorms they're very dangerous to deal with um, if hurricanes are coming up the coast and they can affect where you are on the trail important to know that um, that may be one of those instances where you do want to be in a shelter because there's just too many widow makers at the uh, at whatever campsite that you're at um, another piece of bad advice and this almost gets the face palm uh, icon here but not quite, because that's going to go on the next one. That's related. And that is, don't bring a first aid kit. Well, you know, my philosophy on first aid kits is first aid kits are meant to stop minor problems from becoming major. At least bring bandages and some antibiotic to put on a scraper or a cut. Um, you know, tweezers to pull a tick out, um, some afterbite something you know you'll have to decide what's most meaningful to you i have a short list uh my my first aid kit is like nine ounces you know i hope i don't have to use it but i have had to use it so then the next one is related to the it's the it's the opposite one it's the one that says rather than not bring anything in your uh first aid kit bring everything in your first aid kit should be able to treat broken bones. You should be able to treat snake bite. You should be able to treat all these low probability things that are actually best treated um, by a professional. Um, this this gets the face palm. When I have talked to a lot a lot of long distance hikers, and all the ones I've talked to agree with me. They said the person who made the suggestion that you've got to be able to prepare for every contingency with your first aid kit is not a long distance hiker, doesn't understand risk trade-offs. It's just, it's not possible. There's not really anything that you can reasonably carry in a small first aid kit with your weight limitations that's gonna help you treat a broken leg. You get a broken leg, gotta find some other way to deal with it. You know, hopefully you'll be close enough to uh, a town or something that you can get to some place for treatment, you know, come up with a splint, come up with a makeshift crutch, whatever it takes, or call an SOS. You should have an SOS a tracker with you um, that you can call for assistance. Now, when I fell and dislocated my shoulder, well, you know something? If your leg's not broken, even if you got a broken arm, you can probably manage at least to get to civilization, uh, at least if you're on the Appalachian Trail where it's not that far between roads. So, that's gotta be your contingency plan. Um, there's bug and bear ugly. One says, don't bother with insect repellent. Uh, you know, I guess ticks aren't a problem. You know, that's, uh, 
Uh, there are some. There actually are some people who are naturally, you know, less tasty to the bugs, I guess, and they don't have that much of a problem. Um, but as an across-the-board suggestion, this this comes under bad, maybe not ugly, because it's it's not a a universally smart uh, bit of advice. Um, the next one related is this permethrin based repellents um, I've done research on them and they say they're for clothing only don't don't put them on your skin don't let it near your cat so you know if you love your cat if you have a cat and you love your cat don't even have it in the house uh, it's really toxic to cats um, the whole idea of clothes I mean that's not where I'm putting the the insect repellent on uh, uh, you, you know, they seem to be able to get through your socks, but I've never had them actually get through my shirt. Um, I'm actually putting the repellent on my exposed skin, so I need something that is safe for exposed print, uh, skin, and permethrin is not it. Um, the shaking my damn head face palm icon goes on to go ahead, sleep with your food. I know quite a few hikers who do this, and I have to admit there are occasions where I just felt I had no other choice. There was no good bear hang. I had to take the chance. But in general, it is a bad idea to sleep with your food. Um, some people don't take the bear problem where it exists very seriously. And again, they're just playing Russian roulette. Um, you know, look at the Park Service official positions on things. Um, the The whole idea of a well, if there's a bear box or a bear pole or bear cables, go ahead. I mean, it's it's absurd. It's absolutely absurd not to use them, especially a bear box, which is to me is the is the best solution to the bear problem. But you're not protecting your food only. You're actually trying to keep the wild in the wildlife. Um, and because a bear who becomes uh, accustomed to human food. Um, starts to become a problem bear and may actually need to be destroyed um, if it becomes a threat to humans. So, you know, let's be responsible and don't sleep with your food. There's there's too many instances. Yes, they're rare, um, but it's a it's a an avoidable thing to have a run in with a bear that is is after your food. Just just don't do it. Related to that was um, one hiker who told me, you know, this whole thing about putting your toothpaste, uh, you know, in with your food and, and securing it uh, away from the wildlife. And bear hangs aren't perfect. I know that. But, you know, you do your best. Uh, bear's not after your toothpaste. Well, that's not the position of people knowledgeable in bear lifestyle, you'll call it, the, the biology of bears. They are curious about smells, and they smell very well. So, yeah, they're, they're not, you know, planning on brushing their teeth with your toothpaste, but that's going to attract them. So keeping the toothpaste, somebody had actually, uh, in, on one, one website, it said that they use it for a pillow. Just not a, not a smart idea. Just treat it like food. It has an odor. It will attract bears. It will attract rodents, probably. So just... Don't go there. So finally, there's what I call the generic ugly suggestion. And this is actually from Stumbledore. And he pointed out a lot of people say, you don't need X, whatever X is. So why are you bringing it? Well, I think that's a bit condescending. And it's assuming that everybody's experiences is, is uh, going to be the same. Because I don't use a particular item, therefore you shouldn't use a particular item. And uh, I'm gonna end it here with, with that thought. Um, you know, it gets back to hike your own hike. There are some things you may wanna bring. Your little luxury item. You may wanna bring one luxury item when you're out hiking. That's something I've seen as a suggestion. I think is a good suggestion. They said, divide your stuff you wanna bring into three piles. Stuff you must have, stuff that'd be nice to have, and luxury items. Take the stuff you must have, forget all the stuff that's nice to have, take one luxury item just to make your trip a little more enjoyable. So let's end with that one. So these are the some of the ugliest suggestions that I've actually heard ever as a hiker. Thanks for listening.